let me begin by saying to all of our first time guests, welcome you, and any college students, we welcome you. Those of you joining us online, we're so grateful that you are here. One thing that we want you to know about our church is that we are a Jesus church. We want people to fall in love with Jesus, to find Jesus, to come back to Jesus, and to point others to follow Jesus. And to that end, let me share a couple of, or a few of the guest pastors that we will see in the fall sermon series to help us follow Jesus. First, we have, we'll have Nikki Gumbel joining us not too long from now. He is the pioneer of the Alpha Movement the Alpha that we've been doing for many years, and he's coming from London. Some of you are doing his one-year Bible reading uh, program. I've been doing that for a year. I'm so grateful that Nikki will be joining us. Later on, we have Gary Hagen, the founder of the International Justice Mission, who's going after the, the modern-day slavery movement and abolishing human trafficking. Then you have this brilliant scholar from the uh, Northeast named uh, Carol Kaminsky, Old Testament professor with Gold, uh, Gordon Conwell Seminary. And of course, we have Uncle Jimmy coming back next Sunday. Jim Singleton <laughs> will be joining us once again. Well, today we are starting a four-week series called Welcome Home. Home is a place we all long for. Home is a place where we thrive and where we feel secure. And for those of you who had a child leave for the first time to go either to kindergarten or to college, doesn't matter what age, there's a little sadness, right? It's hard to say goodbye, goodbye because home is where your affections and longings are developed. And for the next four weeks, we will be looking at four kingdom longings that shape us as people of God. These are four kingdom values that we will be shaped as, as followers of Jesus here at Holland Park Presbyterian Church. Now, I know many of you have traveled internationally. Perhaps some of you over the summer months, you traveled overseas. Let me share about my, about my first international traveling experience. Some of you know, know my story. When I was a kid, um, our family immigrated from South Korea to Dallas and the Dallas airport, DFW airport, and I have never flown before, let alone internationally. 14-hour flight. We land on midnight at DFW airport. We're going through the customs. We go down to the baggage claims area. I'm a kid. I have never seen these circular treadmills going round and round. There are multiple of them. Not only that, they're shooting out these bags. I'm like, wow. When you're a kid, what do you do when you see a, a, a merry-go-round? You're going to get on it. So here I am. I got on it. I am running the opposite direction. I, I'm running. I, I am jumping over. I'm hurtling over these bags. And this is such a joy. Ari Lydell, that pure joy that I, he felt, I felt it. You know, this is a great pleasure of God. I'm, as I'm running, I'm looking through my peripheral vision, and I see my uncle, my dad, and this uniformed officer talking. And you could tell they were not happy. Fast forward, let's just say 15 years later, I graduate from college. I have one of those jobs where you travel for work. Monday morning, I'm at the airport. Friday afternoon, I'm back at the airport. And this will go on for years. Baggage claims area is the last place I want to be, <laughs> right? Baggage care. So I did everything possible to, to pack everything in that little suitcase. I could just do a carry-on, not check-in. But if I, even if, if, when I had to go to the baggage carousel area, man, the last thing I wanted was to be there. I would, you know, look at my phone, scrolling, I'm waiting. It was too familiar, too common, too boring. I didn't want anything to do with it. I, I share that story to say that it's possible for some of us here this morning that perhaps you've been going to church for a very long time or you've been following God for a very long time and sometimes it can feel monotonous. Christian faith can feel too familiar or too common and we lose the excitement and the joy of what it means to follow after God. That very first love that we once experienced as God's people, we lose it and we forget how spectacular our Lord is. So if that's you today, if that's you, my hope is that today that you and I can both see God for who he is and what he has done for us, that God is still the God who is amazing, spectacular, beautiful, and God can do impossible things. And that's where Joshua chapter 10 takes us. 
This morning, we're going to be looking at a passage from Joshua chapter 10, beginning in verse 7 through 14. It's one of those great miracle stories. If you read it too fast, you're going to miss out on some of the details of what God is doing. It can be found in the Bible in front of you in page 236, Joshua chapter 10 in the Old Testament, page 236. And let me give you a a background story of what's happening. Many of you know Moses. Moses is a great spiritual leader in the Old Testament. He has led his people, Hebrew people, the people of Israel, out of Egypt, out of slavery. Moses is now old. He wants to pass the baton of leadership to to Joshua, his protege. And Joshua is Moses' assistant, and Joshua is about 40 years old. Now, I say that because you know that in the Bible, number 40 is significant. And 40 is, age 40 is significant in our, in our culture as well, because turning 40 is when everything happens. Life begins, right, at age 40. 40 is new 30. You still feel young. You don't have to act cool. You're already cool when you turn 40. 40 can be the gateway to the fulfilling life, but it comes with a cost. You got to get through it because you'll be tested in your 40s. In the Bible, number 40 represents a time of testing and trials. The rain fell for 40 days and 40 nights for Noah. Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years. Jesus, he was tested and tempted in the desert for 40 days. And at age 40, Joshua is now about to enter into this battle, and he is about to be tested. And here's how it reads, verse 7. I'm going to be preaching verse by verse today. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So pause. An epic battle is about to occur. This is like movie-worthy scene. There were these five kings of Amorites, and they have joined alliances, and they're going after the city called Gibeon. And when Gibeonites, when they found out that there's about to be a battle that's about to happen, and they know they're going to lose the war, they go to their neighboring region and ask Joshua, 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 can you help us? Because we're we're about to enter into this battle that we know we're going to lose. And Joshua said, sure, I'll help you guys. And Joshua gathers, gathers up the very best, the brightest, the men of valor, He brings the army rangers, navy seals, special forces, and literally he has trained up the best of the best for this surprise attack. But before the battle begins, God delivers a special message to Joshua. God says in verse 8, Joshua, I have given the enemies into your hand. Don't be afraid. And here's what I want you to see in verse 8. Now I know that school is just starting back up. God speaks in present perfect tense. Present perfect tense. Present perfect tense, meaning that it describes a past action that has present consequence. Something that has happened in the past that matters to you today in this present moment. And God says, I have given them into your hand. God is saying, Joshua, you have already won the war. And and Joshua is scratching his head saying, what do you mean, God? I have not, we haven't even started the war, the battle. So here's our first takeaway. We serve a God who fights a battle for us in advance that we don't even know that we're fighting in this present moment. And the battle is victorious because God is victorious. And and Joshua might have had the best trained army, but God says, this kind of battle, you need me. I'm going to fight the battle for you. Let's go on. Verse 9. So Joshua came up upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal, and the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon, and struck them as far as Azekah and Makeda. Verse 11. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Wow. So I have a family member that I dearly love, and um, 
He graduated from West Point. He's an officer in the army. You could probably tell from the picture who he is. Uh, serves with air defense, even currently served over 25 years. He's been in Afghanistan, Iraq, multiple times been deployed in the Middle East. He is a colonel, a brigade commander. He oversees, his team oversees. Are you all familiar with the Iron Dome? What Iron Dome is, the, the air missile defense system or the Patriot missiles here in America. So that's his team, right? So time to time, I uh, text him. I was texting with him a couple of weeks ago, and I, I say to him, hey, c- can you tell me like some top secret things that are happening in the Middle East? <laughs> what I want to know, I want to know like now what's happening. And he usually responds in the same way. He goes, Jay, if I do, I have to kill you. You know that. He just says, just read Twitter, read X. That's when you get all the latest information. But what he does tell me is that before any kind of battle that uh, U.S. gets involved in, they go through all kinds of scenario planning. He's also a professor in war college where he teaches strategy to, the, to the, 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 those on the front lines. He tells me how um, they go through plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, all kinds of worst case scenarios in the battle. So I, I, I firmly believe that Joshua, he had all kinds of scenario planned out. But this is one particular scenario that he could not plan out. You know what happened? Did you read what happened? All of a sudden, it begins to rain. And not only it rains, the hailstorm comes down. And verse 11 says this, that more enemies die from the hailstones than by the swords of the Israelites. So I hope you see what's happening here. There is a miracle story within a miracle story, right? I don't know how the hell storms back in the Old Testament worked, but it had like a GPS missile guided uh, stones because somehow it's raining and the hell stones were only hitting the Amorites, but not the Israelites. Incredible, impossible, right? So I did my research. According to NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, do you know how long an average hell storms last in America? About five minutes. It's about five minutes. Here's the point. That God can do exceedingly more in just a short amount of time than we can ever do with all of our strategizing and planning and worst case scenario planning. That God can do so much more in a short amount of time. You see, in our humanness, Especially in times of stress, we like to create our own future, and we try to control our outcomes. And Dallas Willard says that we need to abandon outcomes to God, and he writes, it's in the easy yoke of Jesus that we learn to abandon outcomes to God and trust our souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. And abandoning outcomes is the spiritual formation practice of surrendering and learning to not force things or making things happen on our own. And we do this by practicing the way of Jesus where we take on the character of Jesus, his humility, his humbleness, his patience, and we become like Christ. As another pastor said, he writes, God reveals his purpose to those who release their security. God releases purpose to those who release their security. Now, don't get me wrong, because as God's people, we do have to act. We have to prepare. We have to respond. Yes, God gave him the victory, but Joshua, he still fought the battle, right? He had to go into the the battle. But we need to learn how to cooperate with God's timing and submit to his ways. All right, let's go on to the next verse. The battle isn't quite over yet. Verse 12. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. Now, I think, I think Joshua had this longing to go back to his home sooner than later because he praised this impossible prayer so that the, the battle would end. He, he, he prays for the sun to stand still so that his army would have more daylight to pursue the enemies. I mean, this is a, this is a bold prayer. 
Joshua didn't, he didn't pray for the enemies to stand still so his army could, could capture and imprison them. He doesn't pray for the horses and chariots to stand still. No, he prays for that big ball of burning fire up in the heaven in the sky to stand still. This, this is an impossible prayer. And see how the Lord responds in verse 13. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. And let me point out a couple of things about Joshua's prayer. First, Joshua prayed this very bold prayer in a public space, in public setting. This This prayer was not a quiet prayer. This wasn't like a private whisper prayer where he would go to his prayer closet and pray by himself. No, a very public prayer in front of his army. You know how it can be very awkward to pray out loud in front of people, right? It can be very awkward. I mean, I would say that this is is more than awkward. This is bold. And sometimes I I admit that um, I get afraid to pray out, out loud, bold prayers, impossible prayers, because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, what if, what if God does not answer your prayers that you ask of me? Because I don't want you to be disappointed. Not only that, I don't want you to be, get disappointed at God. So I'm, I'm saying this to all myself. Some of you, you've been praying and waiting for a long time. Some of you have uh, family members who are sick, and you've been praying for a very long time. And what if God does not answer your prayer? Because I don't like to disappoint people. But you see, you see how that is also a form of controlling the outcome. Because I'm trying to appease your emotions. I'm trying to to trying to defend God so He will look good in front of you. Our God does not need to be defended. Our God is God. And, and we can approach God for who he is and what he has done for us. And, and we can approach God no matter what the outcomes are. And we need to believe that God can do the impossible. And the second thing that I want you to notice about Joshua's prayer is that uh, Joshua's prayer was birthed out of a terrible situation that he put himself into. And let me set up the passage one more time. Essentially, the reason why Joshua had to fight this battle is, is because he got into a very bad partnership and alliance with the very people that he was supposed to uh, not be involved in. If you read Joshua chapter 9 and chapter 10, you'll see that. So now he finds himself needing God to get him out of a situation that he got himself into because of the bad choices that he made. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever needed God to get you out of a situation that you got yourself into? And perhaps you pray, God, I'm in a financial mess because of bad investment that I made because I trusted in this partner that I thought that he would come through. Help me, get me out of this situation. God, I'm in a relationship that's not going well. I really need your help to get me out of this. God, I've been pursuing things of this world that's not giving me any satisfaction. I Help me to give me purpose and meaning to life. So if you are in a place where you need God's help because of, of, of the choices that you made, some bad choices, I want you to know that you can relate to Joshua. And not only that, not only that, here's who our God is. That God, our God is able to turn our mistakes into a miracle. And don't forget that. And I love this about our God, that God can make impossible things possible. And here's one more thing that I love about Joshua's prayer. He gets it wrong. I don't know if you've picked up on this. He, he got it wrong. He, he prays for the sun to stand still. You know, scientifically speaking, about 3,000 3, years later after the battle that Joshua was involved in, in the 16th century, there is a, a Polish astronomer by the name of Copernicus that he comes onto the scene. And he says, you know what? Actually, the earth is not in the middle of the solar system. It's actually the sun. The sun is in the middle of the solar system. And all the planets and stars and the moon, they, because by the gravitational pull of the sun, they are revolving around the sun. The sun already is standing still. Okay? So it's the earth <laughs> that paused on its axis. Joshua couldn't even get the prayer right. 
But God is not impressed with the words filled with religiosity or perfection, all, all the flowery language that we use when we pray. No, God cares about our authentic heart. That's what God desires. The heart that longs to go back to God over and over again because that's where home is found. That's where we thrive as God's people. And let me end with this. Verse 14 says, There has never been a day like the day when the sun stood still and the Lord listened to, listened to a man. In, in the Old Testament, there is a um, little-known Jewish law that says when you, when you have a criminal uh, die on a pole or on a tree, that you have to get that dead person's body off the pole as soon as possible before the sunset. This is in Deuteronomy, I'm not making this up, Deuteronomy chapter 21, according to the holiness code of the Jewish purity law. Now you may be asking, Jay, where are you going with this? Hundreds of years later, God sends his one and only son, Jesus, to earth. Philippians chapter 2 says that he is perfect. He's fully human and fully God. He is perfect. He is sinless. And he comes to die for us because sin is what separates us from God. And if you know the gospel accounts, on the day when Jesus was crucified on Good Friday, Matthew 27 says that there was darkness that came down for three hours. It's as if the sun set when Jesus was dying. There was a guy named Joseph of Arimathea and his friends who were trying really hard and they were hurrying to get the dead body of Jesus off the cross because they knew the, the holiness code. The purity law says that you cannot have a dead person's body on a pole or a tree. You have to get it out because he would desecrate the land. They did everything possible to get Jesus into a tomb. And friends, I find this interesting that God allows for the sun to stand still for Joshua, to give him that extra light for him to have victory. And for Jesus, God allows his one and only son to stand still on the cross in the darkness. And it's in that stillness, as he was dying, although it looked like the darkness was winning, God was working in advance fighting the battle on our behalf so that we will always, that we will always have the light of Jesus to be victorious in this present moment, all for you and me. And I have this profound gratitude knowing that the sun stood still for Joshua and for Jesus, the sun set, and he died, but he was resurrected for you and me so that, so that we can have life with God. So my brothers and sisters, in light of this astonishing truth, what would it look like for you to trust in areas where you no longer trust? And then what does it look like for you in those moments when you don't think it's possible, but for you to put your faith in that gap? Because that's what it means for the people of God to come back home. That's where we belong, to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you for showing yourself to the all-powerful God who hears and answers our prayers. And we praise you that you hold everything together, the sun, the moon, and the stars, the daylight, the nighttime, the joys and sorrows. You hold everything together. And we praise you, Lord, that nothing is impossible with you. May we long for you every day, every day. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.